Welcome to the Insight Myanmar podcast. Before we get into today's show, I wanted to let you know that we have a lot more written and video content on our website. If you haven't visited it yet, we invite you to take a look at www.insightmyanmar.org. In addition to complete information about all of our past episodes, there's also a variety of blogs, books, and videos to check out. And you can also sign up for our regular newsletter. But for now, enjoy what follows, and remember, sharing is caring. I'm really pleased on this episode of Inside Myanmar podcast. I'll be talking to Toza Lat, and we're going to be discussing the uh, recent history of communication in Myanmar, the importance of different ways and technologies of communication, also the security risks, tracing it historically over the last few decades, and looking at what are the current communication needs and challenges today and what is being done to meet those challenges for those in the democracy movement. So, Tozalat, thank you so much for making the time to join and talk about this important topic with us. Thanks for inviting me, mate. Mm, right. So you have quite a history, both in terms of your research as a reporter, as well as uh, living through this as uh, some of the work that you've done. Uh, start us off with telling us, going back several decades and talking about some of the communication realities and challenges and uh, how things were several decades ago in Myanmar. Um, yes, I'm working as a journalist for the last 20 years. Um, I was with the DVB, Democratic Advice Obama is in exile media, but I was invited back to Burma, Myanmar uh, back in 2012. So historically, Burma, Myanmar is run by military government since 1962, and they have attitude to anti-communication. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Burma, Myanmar was uh, until now very heavy censorship. Right. And also um, in the in the past, I mean, it was very anti-communication and information flow, especially independent information flow, um, especially military general. They have they use media as a as a tool or, or more more about controlling about the information. Mm -hmm. So only you know country where you have you have to pay maybe one thousand US dollar to one thousand five hundred. US dollar to obtain a SIM card at, until, 90, uh, until 2010. Mm -hmm. and when I was invited in 2012 back to Yangon after operating from Exile Media, my first uh, SIM card I have to pay for 500 US dollar through uh, MPT, Myanmar Post and Telecommunication, owned by Ministry of Information. It is a joint venture. In those days, there was uh, only communication. Um, right after that, you know, um, um, there was a, 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 let me go quickly, you know, about the historical event in Myanmar. Sure. There was a military coup in 1962 by General Nguyen, and then one party rule until 1988 uprising. I was one of the students at the in 1988. And then there was a 1990 election, of course, and the National League for Democracy won landslide, but they never honor uh, the then, you know, those days, they, the military coup again and changed their name to SLOC, S-L-O-R-C, State Law and Order Restoration Council. Later, they changed to SPDC, State Peace and Development Council, up to 2008, a uh, draft in our constitution. And then there was an election in 2010 election, 
of course, and the main opposition party boycotted. But in 2012, Don San Suu Kyi decided to contest the by election and start entering the uh, entering the parliament. So that is a that is a early opening of so called parliamentary democracy uh, period in Myanmar. Until up to then, there was no independent information flow. There was only one version of truth, which is the army version of truth. The media was tightly controlled. The censorship was very heavy. It was only state TV and radio, AMA TV, NAMA radio and television, and army TV channel called Nyawadi was the only allow, allow media space. Right. And in, in this time, just to interrupt for a moment, in this time of not having any internet or any official means of being able to broadcast or put information out, what became very popular as kind of spreading information in some kind of informal way was the tea shop. So describe the importance of the tea shop during those years. Okay. Um, I was grown up in 1988. Our primary source of information was shortwave radio and, and uh, via like BBC Burmese service. Actually, the very well-known 8888, the target date for the Democratic Rally, it's broadcast out of the BBC Burmese service from London. And we received that, those information from, like you mentioned, from the tea shop. So it is a communication is more face-to-face, you know, person, you know, uh, only uh, in us, like, uh, and that kind of target. And that's how we share information and that's how we gather. In those days, like, in uh, throughout the Southeast Asia, there were the uh, kind of, you know, uh, generation that, you know, how we... Uh, personal information is very rare and very difficult, hard to communicate, mainly face to face. There were no, not very effective um, uh, telephone or, or internet was not there. And in the case of Bama Myanmar, it was not very effective until 2013. So, um, given this background, on top of that, Army General has very tendency to control the information flow. That's why they make it very expensive. Mm-hmm. Come on, ridiculous, you know, to own a telephone SIM card, 1,000 US dollar, 1,500 US dollar, mm-hmm. and very limited service allow. Um, you know, so until 2012, um, that is the beginning of the opening up um, under the things in government, because uh, Don San Suu Kyi and Andy start getting into the parliament, and there were a series of reforms introduced. One of the reforms is relaxing on telecommunication center. So in 2013, and those military, uh, semi military government, uh, uh, called tender for telecommunication operator. They were, uh, I was in already in Yango. Hmm. And, and very, I remember when I went to get to internet, I had to go to uh, Shangri La Hotel at the tea shop, you know, to connect with my fellow friends in Thailand or, or in Norway those days back. And only the very international uh, hotel has a very limited, slow internet access and very expensive. And also it is heavily surveillance by the Burmese army. Mm-hmm. So that, 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 that's a history of communication, you know, how I've been through, uh, how, how to connect with the uh, outside world. And then, you know, they, they suddenly MPT was the only player in my post and telecommunication. And you know, they are the key player. And mainly it is a joint venture with um, Ministry of Information or Ministry of uh, Communication uh, with the Japanese farm. And then they start allowing the telecommunication company in early 2013. I remember correctly, you know, there were 19 companies bid up and there were the two winners. One is a Norwegian-owned Telenor in 2013 and then Oridu, that is a Doha uh, quarter-based uh, telecommunication company start coming into Bama Myanmar. That is the beginning of the opening of the telecommunication center. And also the introduction of the uh, Facebook social media. Social media started in 2013. And then, you know, now there are around 28 to 30 million uh, active uh, account users. And then suddenly, you know, um, uh, 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 social media, Facebook, and, and, and communication is, was very popular. I think both these two private uh, uh, operators, Telenor and Oridu, they left after a military coup again in 2021 because of the deny 
to collaborate and intercept you know, surveillance technology into their their service and they especially tell you know, they refuse to provide their, their audience data. I'm talking about 50 million uh, user that are transferred to the military. And also for Telino case, they worry that there will be um, economic sanction by European and uh, European Parliament and European government. So they left and so they are operation to the private owner. Mm, and just to back up a, a moment before this, we were talking about the development of cell phones and cell phone SIM cards originally were very expensive and then they got cheaper when the market was opened up. But to go back even before cell, phone to, cell phones existed, um, because I think there's a big difference between how cell phones came to America, for example, and how they came to Myanmar. In America, for example, most every home and business, every, an office, everyone had a phone, everyone had a home phone. And so then when we got the cell phones, basically it was it was like everyone had a private phone line they can take with them everywhere they went. And th- the difference was that instead of a family sharing uh, a, a phone at home, every individual person got to take their phone with them. But in Myanmar, it was, it was quite different because you didn't have most homes, most families owning phones. I remember when I first arrived in 2007, there were, um, if you wanted to call someone in an apartment block, there might be one phone in an entire apartment block of hundreds of people. Sometimes there would be one phone in several apartment blocks. You would call a street corner and you would tell them which apartment and which which building and which number you wanted to contact. It'd be several hundred people sharing. There were also, instead of pay phones, there were one of the things you saw pre-2010 Yangon is these phone booths that would just be uh, clerks that would be behind a counter with just a typical phone. And there'd be three phones, there'd be long lines, and you'd make a, make a call from, from those phones to, you know, those public phones to another set of public phones. So w- what do you remember, before cell phones even came to Myanmar, what, what do you remember about the way that, that phone lines of any way were used and how secure they were? It was the... They put it, they make it very difficult for security reason. So the communication is tightly controlled and monitored. That's why what you mentioned about those days, you know, if you want to call someone, you have to go through an operator. Mm-hmm. These are all registered at phone. Mm-hmm. The phone was very expensive. Like I mentioned, like SIM card or, or landline. Uh, and th- those days, you are, what you have mentioned is about landline. Mm-hmm. And uh, also the cell phone was not that, that allowed that much. Uh, only some crony and business. And even, you know, the funny thing is, uh, if you go overseas, if you have a telephone, it's as regard as a, your access, mm-hmm. very valuable access, uh, regard as uh, property like house and telephone number. Yeah. It used to be, right. used to be, it is your grandee that you are rich. You are, you have right. access to telephone. Yeah. Because of the simply, um, army general has a funny idea of controlling communication and monitoring most of the communication. That is, a, that is a, a, the history of uh, 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 Army General uh, mentality over controlling about the communication. So you are quite right that uh, in, before 2010 was you know, heavily regulated through the operator, and most of them are monitored. After, right, in those days, also what popular is, they start allowing the private uh, internet cafe Mm-hmm. And you have to be registered at MPT mm-hmm. uh, under the information and uh, Myanmar Post and Telecommunication. And also, most of the, most of those, you know, um, internet cafe are also heavily surveillance. Yeah, and all the server, it's going through the army or military control uh, communication uh, department. And so, so you are you are right that you know, to 2010, um, Burma Myanmar communication is heavily censored, control and monitor and also register re- by the registration. Mm-hmm. So you have to go through operator, you have to go through the particular server, you need license mm-hmm. to get a, a both you know landline and, and, and phone line. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's important for two reasons to keep in mind. I think the first reason you've already hit upon, and that's that you mentioned Burma being a place where face-to-face trust and contact is very important. And and that's true even to this day. You know, even to this day, having someone vouch for you, having face-to-face meetings, being able to personally know someone that takes on an outsized importance as it does in other societies. And I think that when you understand this history, this helps to understand how um, because uh, there, there was such a limit on information flow, because there was such a control 
on being able to have any semblance of private communication with someone through, you know, any form of phone line or mail or anything else, the tea shops take on this outsized importance that you actually have to sit down with someone face to face, talk in a whisper at a tea shop to them. And that's where this trust is developed and based. And I think that explains why to this day, the the sense of, of trust and closeness and proximity are still so important in Myanmar versus, you know, establishing connections on, um, on email or, or other types of things. The, the face-to-face is, is still so vital. But I think the second point that this kind of history illustrates to us is I hope that it's giving an appreciation to our audience listening in now, just how fast things developed in Myanmar, just the lightning speed, the warp speed that happened where as opposed to like the United States where you go from having a uh, most everyone has a phone line in your house to suddenly you have a mobile phone with you you could take around in Myanmar you're talking about going from the phone being an exclusive object of privilege that even if you do have it everything is monitored everything is listened to you're going from that reality very quickly in just a matter of years to suddenly not only does everyone have affordable mobile phones and affordable SIM cards, but also everyone is on Facebook and everyone is chatting and reading so-called news and everything else. And so it was really just this watershed moment of going from a very tightly controlled totalitarian state with very limited access to information and freedom of of, of communication to suddenly the things just just opened up and pouring out. And I think that led to a lot of confusion, understandably, in how to adapt from one extreme to another. That's correct. Um, especially in youth and students, they're always, you know, uh, always forefront of the uh, democratic struggle. So like you mentioned, and the, 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 the meeting between student activists and youth usually take place in teacher face-to-face, and then you know suddenly there is an open up, mm. um, and then you know uh, from that from that face to face to overnight and uh, to giant and uh, international telecommunication uh, uh, tax uh, communication came in, and I remember you know the overnight the, the my my five hundred dollars MBD same car, and the next day you can start buying uh, one thousand five hundred jet, a dollar, which is one point. Yeah. A dollar, one by five dollar, available uh, from Telenor and uh, 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 Oridu operator uh, on top of this MPT. So I I know that I remember people queuing and furious about buying. You know, cannot believe that you know um, there is a very cheap uh, SIM card available. So at first, you know. And then, you know, the uh, Telenor start building their network, you know, uh, it's expand rapidly. And from Yango to Mandalay, Big City, Nebido, and they start putting up more relay station, more output, you know, than their coverage reach. I mean, within, they start operating in, they, they got the license around 2030 and, and, and both. And, and then, you know, there was a, 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 a second operator already got the license, Telenor got the license. And they expand their network overnight, and then you know the the same car was one thousand five hundred, very cheap, and the, the, their coverage it's rapidly expand, mm-hmm. and then and then suddenly Burmese army also you know they don't let it alone. They suddenly uh, introduce uh, Mindtel. You know the funny thing is Mindtel is they operated. Mindtel is owned by two biggest Southeast Asia army. Mindtel is. Uh, joint venture with Burmese Army and the Vietnamese Army. It's called v- uh, Vietnam. So until now, uh, they are the number four operator because of telecom that is suddenly overnight, very popular, affordable, and they make lots of profit. Burma Myanmar really love consuming data. If you look at those past data, you know, they're telling now, already do, and then make very lucrative business and, you know, at the same time, there are uninvited problem like Bama Myanmar majority. They were like both. They both enjoying like uh, Telino having a twenty million uh, uh, customer and and uh, already do having a, a fifty million customer uh, within very short periods. And the data is uh, easily available. And and then you know the majority user has no uh, digital or, or, or information literacy. So the Facebook become suddenly one of the popular uh, media uh, of communication. Like you rightly mentioned, 
Bama mima mima uh, economics also leap forward. Like suddenly there is a mobile banking become very popular overnight because uh, banking was very difficult. It, I mean, because of this communication barrier uh, to have a bank account uh, is very difficult. Then suddenly there is a, a money exchange and, and, and then uh, the telephone payment, you know, online payment. And also the, 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 the telephone uh, tele, tele banking overnight. So that is uh, rapid. But at the same time, information literacy, majority bummies are very low. And then, you know, there is an invited problem of misinformation, disinformation, male information, deliberately produced by the Burmese army again. Then army staff forming, you know, cybercrime unit and sending their soldiers to Russia and China to learn how to monitor. In the old days, you know, I was with the DVB, uh, and DVB website was under DDoS attack. And also most of the exam media was under heavily uh, the, the, the uh, virus, you know, DDoS attack by the Burmese army, you know, organized groups start attacking on the independence media website. And so this is a, this is a very, very, uh, in one hand, a lot of majority ordinary people enjoy start getting access to information. And also at the other hand, on the other hand, a lot of people don't have uh, information literacy. Burmese and especially in online, there are a lot of misinformation, disinformation, and male information are heavily sagging like that. On top of that, there is a delivery army psych war. Until now, they're using very effective psychological warfare, targeting to their own soldier, plus, you know, majority, majority uh, Burmese, uh, Burmese population. If you look at army spokesperson, uh, General Zomenton, he stay run the, his, his mother unit is called and public relation and psychological warfare attached to the commander in chief before the army military coup. So the army primary function is psychological warfare and uh, target into their own soldier and then 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 then, then uh, general public. So so information is always you know for the general or, or, or Burmese army always they use as a weapon and uh, to to monitor and also to, to counter about the uh, democratic movement uh, and it dissents. So this is the, the overnight situation that Burma suddenly changed from very close country. And also this is the, the new generation that they call it Generation Z. At least, you know, they have uh, uh, five to seven years of information, free access to information, make them connect with the outside world. And that's why they are very well knowledge and uh, equipped that that that's a, that's a, that is a, one of the key challenge for Burmese army to control, especially blocking our information flow, and also producing their own narrative, one version of army truth. It's no longer relevant to those you know younger generation because they got the they got the taste of the information flow and openness and connected with the entire world. That's what you know the Gen Z and the, the, the new generation of anti coup and democratic forces after 2021 military coup, make a very forefront of the biggest resistance today. And also the biggest challenge to army because of this, you know, they can never shut down Obama again because of there is already information flow open up. So now these days, you know, and I mean, even Mizima, we have a 23 million online. And on our Facebook, 23 million followers is a lot. On our YouTube, where we have a millions of followers. Follower. And also on top of that, we have a, a satellite TV and shortwave radio and also the FM. And I think FM, uh, local FM are also very popular because of uh, army is, you know, now cutting off most of the communication in the conflict area. So there is no information flow. So we have to, um, a lot of area go back to rather, you know, short, shortwave radio or, or the, or the, uh, or the FM radio uh, information on top of this satellite information. So my point is that, you know, there is no way army can control information and digital platform about information flow these days. That's make army one of the biggest challenge. And, and Burmese army facing is all these, you know, uh, independence information flow and uh, via money, uh, TV, radio, and online. This is the also biggest challenge for army at the moment. Mm, there's something really interesting you said. I just want to go back to where you're describing the experience of the transition years 
and you you really beautifully described the the chaos and and the swirling forces coming from different directions happening simultaneously. I was just taking notes and 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 noted down four different elements you said. This era was marked by an open flow of information and communication like never before. It was marked by media literacy. It was marked by military spying to greater degrees and having more to be able to spy on. And it was marked by military propaganda, PSYOP campaigns to be able to convince their soldiers and the populace of certain things. And so these are really strong forces, positive and negative, that are just all being unleashed with really no no uh, no holds barred, um, just free flowing overnight. You know, going from a- an era of decades and decades where there was such limited flow of information and communication, where the tea shop became this kind of um, metaphor and as well as physical place where you could actually talk to people carefully and exchange news. Going from that to just having kind of all the dams bursting simultaneously at once. And it almost feels like it's going to take us years, if not decades, to really understand what was happening in that era because things just, everything just ignited and, and came through all at once. Yes. Um, and say now, you know, um, those, you know, independent uh, uh, operators that are gone because uh, they don't want to uh, negotiate with the army, especially they are surveillance, they refuse. And army where uh, they refuse. So what happened is they sold out to the army crony. So for example, Telenor, they sold to um, uh, Norwegian group, they, they, they sold to M1, which is a Lebanese and Burmese crony. And also Oridu, they sold it to another group, a Singapore joint venture, and refusing to collaborate uh, with the army over data surveillance. So only actively now is rem- what remains is MPT as always, Nama Post and Telecommunication, and MindTed. MindTed is, uh, I already mentioned that uh, uh, both, you know, two biggest Southeast Asia army, Myanmar and mm-hmm. Vietnamese army own operator remain. Mm-hmm. And also, um, uh, uh, also there are, there are uh, heavy uh, censorship. On top of that, there is a lot of information blackout. For example, recently there is a bomb in uh, 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 one of the village, uh, 170 people died and internationally known in Sakai area. And nearby uh, village, they don't know there was a big bombing and there was a mass care. Mm. Because uh, there is an uh, affected information cut, blackout. They deliberately cut out all the, all the telecommunication and also they block, you know, most of the, uh, most of the, most of the, uh, 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 same cut, most of the telephone, telephone line. And also only the, the information they got is from the, via uh, independent operator from outside. And so that, that is a, another challenge. How do we get information from those blackout areas? And, uh, uh, and also, Bama Myanmar completely changed now because uh, more than 50% of territory is not under military control. It is more like semi liberated, uh, either uh, ethnic armed groups or, or newly liberated, newly formed uh, uh, PDF, or, or, or there is a Pakapa uh, local administrator. Then, you know. Then there is a heavy or uh, delivery information uh, cut, or, or they switch off a lot of area about telecommunication. So now this now a day, you know, from this given this history to the currently, there is a greater demand to have a proper independent um, uh, communication means um, apart from this heavily army surveillance. So there is a little hope. That you know, there is an American NDAA and Bama app, somebody known as Bama app, recently spread out. They are going to help not only the uh, uh, communicate, not only the support, mainly focus on strategic communication uh, on, on Bama. But there is no clear spread out. But now, currently, you know, the, about the democratic and democratic and federal forces. One of the biggest demand is to have a have a, a strategic communication and need. And, and, and then, you know, own uh, communication facility uh, without going through uh, army monitor, uh, monitor server or, 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 or their network. So, uh, and also on top of that, there is a Burma Myanmar having a, a humanitarian crisis. One third of the country, I'm talking about around 20 million people in urgent need of 
uh, humanitarian aids. Uh, and, 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 you know, the conflict is more than uh, half of the country. And I mean, it is effectively blocking. And also there is no information. How can they get access to those, you know, very vital humanitarian uh, uh, delivery needs? Everybody talking about it. And also there is a greater demand for independent uh, information flow, uh, especially mm-hmm. those seemingly, seemingly liberated area or, or, or other uh, EO control area uh, need, a, need, a, need a greater uh, communication and strategic communication needs. So this is this also this way to determine how Obama Myanmar's future is going to be. You know, so I think there is a there is a huge gap and huge demand about this. You know, need for uh, information flow and uh, independent information flow. What I mean is both you know online, digital, TV, and also telecommunication. So this is the this is the latest situation that you know we are. We are facing uh, and also mm-hmm. the, the on, on ground situation. So the one of the biggest challenges how how can sure. you provide these you know information needs and information uh, flow of information to mm-hmm. to Burma Myanmar people for their day to day survival needs. Yeah, I, I want to go back to the start of the coup because I want to I want to try to go chronologically towards what we were laying out. We talked about the the the, the pre cell phone era and how how limited access was then. The role of the tea shop. We talked about the transition when the floodgates just opened. So let's go now to the start of the coup. You know, the the coup happens February first, twenty twenty one, and there uh, and and when the in the hours that the coup happened, literally for several hours, internet is shut off all over the country, so people in the country can't communicate about what's going on. And then over the next several months, there's kind of weird things going on with the internet. There's there's a period where it's something like 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. or something. The, the the internet is consistently off in those hours. And for those of us that are overseas, we we kind of as, as 11 a as, as 11 p.m. Myanmar time approaches, we kind of hold with bated breath what's going to happen that night because we know we're not going to be getting news. There's rumors in in those first several months that they're just going to cut internet completely, like like for good. They're just going to stop all internet in the country until they get control. Uh, can you describe a bit, as far as you know about the military's thinking, why 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 does why does internet persist to this day? Why did they allow it? Why did they not just completely cut all access to it so that they can have a more iron rule? And why does it really exist in any form? Okay, um, let me recall. You know, the first day I was in in Yango and the military coups, and you know, um, there were a lot of rumor before the coups. But when I know the coups around four a.m. Um, February first. And um, one of my friends who got arrested, 88 generation, they, he sent out the information that I got arrested. It is a military coup. So I didn't believe. So I drove up. I, first I drive to the uh, army headquarters in eight mile, and there is nothing happening. Then I, I drive back, uh, back to the uh, city hall in Yango. Then I start seeing the army truck, and there is a, a heavy security presence. Then I start writing my, on my, in my, in my uh, uh, Facebook account. And saying that there is military coups, and then suddenly I got both, you know, local leader internationally called, and everybody asking, "What is what is going on? Where are you?" I said, "I'm in City Hall. There is a heavy army present, and there is a military coups. That is the first way for it." And then I went back to my house, and then I turned on uh, television because uh, those days, DVB uh, and also uh, Mizima uh, uh, running the terrorist uh, uh, television license from the. Uh, Ministry of Information. We are running the, our uh, our uh, our uh, our television uh, operation on the uh, MPD platform, and then suddenly uh, DVB and Mizima, uh, our channel is freeze, and and until then, you know, they are they already pulled out. But um, that is the first response that you know uh, I face the uh, uh, information uh, cut off. So our television signal gone overnight. And then I have a uh, three, uh, you know, three, four uh, internet access. I have both, you know, uh, Telenor, MBD, uh, also Oridu. Uh, I have a, I have my own routers and stuff. They stay working until up to, I think, uh, they revoke. Uh, and there was no immediate action apart from freezing our our terrestrial uh, digital TV signal. There is a limited allowance until I think. Uh, March, and they start announcing that they revoke our officially revoke 
our license. I think it is in March, uh, I think March, March or May 18, you know, maybe one or two months later. And then they start, uh, they start a restriction on those, those uh, other, uh, first they go for the television, of course, which is the most rich and uh, digital terrestrial uh, broadcast. Later, they start going on in, into the uh, internet uh, uh, telecom uh, operator, namely uh, both, you know, the Telenor and Oridu. And maybe they may, they may be series of negotiation. Basically, army want to install, I think Chinese or Russia, Russia uh, back uh, the surveillance, data surveillance center. So the, at the beginning, we had the both operator refuse. You know, they need to, they are obliged to protect their private data. Um, but then, you know, of course, this is the army. And so I think everything go wrong right after maybe uh, four months, five months, right after the military coups. And there is a heavy demand to monitor on the dissidents and youth and students. And also, you know, also the, the, the spring revolution. I mean, they are the, they are the mainly youth and students. And remember, there is a first-time voter, 5 million first-time voter in 2020 election, um, pre coups So they, they, are the, they are the main driving force of this spring revolution. They are the, we call it uh, uh, data, uh, they are the, they are the uh, native, uh, native uh, internet user. We are the migrant. And they know uh, very well how to use internet, how to use uh, mobile, how to use effectively, not only use. You know, they, they're very good, this young generation. They call themselves Gen Z, which is a 5 million first time vote done in 2020. And then uh, one of the key dissidents in 2021 military coups. So the army start re- realized that they somehow has to back, control back the, uh, all these communication channel, starting from television, and then they go, uh, they go to a, a telecommunication provider, and then data and digital platform. So that's how they start controlling. You know, that is no wonder. And both, you know, these two operators suddenly decide to sort out. I mean, they are very lucrative business. They're making lots of money. If you look at Burmese, and uh, these short lived for the and, uh, and the government, you know, business set up. Burma Myanmar telecommunication set up was booming. And I think uh, the telephone. Uh, uh, in density, it is 120%, uh, which means um, Burma Myanmar having a two, three active uh, Senka and the data and the, the telecommunication data is a lot of consuming. A lot of people are buying data and enjoying these, you know, uh, freedom, uh, uh, limited access. I was, I, when I was a young old, I went to Berlin and uh, Germany. I think the young old internet is faster than Germany internet those days. I've been to Europe, I've been to many countries. I think Myanmar was one of the faster. But then overnight, they all slowed up. And army start controlling and monitoring and demanding that their surveillance equipment will be installed. That's, that's the main reason that, you know, those international, I mean, like Telenor, Telenor not only operate in Burma, it is a small market. They operate in, in Thailand and India. They have a big footprint. Same as Oridu, Oridu also. Then, you know, they decided to so. And so they are, they are, they are, they are operation to the cronies and, and, and armies, basically refusing to compromise with their, uh, the surveillance and also their privacy data to hand over to the army. So since then, army is becoming very actively, you know, getting the mainly help from China and Russia. About China, they got the, they got the firewall, mm-hmm. basically to control uh, the, their own soldier. And, and they, they have their own creation of um, their AI, you know, and they have their, they are to keep their soldier uh, online, you know, in a particular particular place. And they, they, they activate their uh, active uh, Saiwa, uh, Saiwa uh, in the highest level. And also they start controlling and monitoring and, 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 and surveillance over the independence uh, uh, operator. Uh, and also only active is only the army control mindset. And, and I think after, after one year and now after two years of military coups, most of the, most of the uh, television and, and because of the revoke the, 
13 uh, media houses uh, operating license, including DVB and Mizima. Mizima uh, license, broadcast license was revoked. And, and then I think 152 journalists was jailed, and four was killed. And Bama Myanmar suddenly began one of the wars. Uh, uh, wars I mean, the recent, yesterday, uh, May 3 was a press freedom day. Our press free uh, 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 index were 173 out of 180 countries. From military coup, it was around 140. So the freedom of expression is no longer yeah. uh, permitted. And there is a heavy censorship on top of that. There is a uh-huh. very, going back to the old days of, old days of, you know, controlling over and uh, communication flow and both TV and only the state TV is uh, available and only, only the uh, army monitor uh, internet. And also they heavily monitor over the money transition. And because of a lot of, a lot of support, you know, from the overseas permits and uh, flowing back to inside Burma, Myanmar resistance groups. So they do actively monitor on that kind of money flow and also the information flow. And so this is, you know, and now after two years of military group, from the first day, first thing army do respond is, of course, controlling all the information flow. But good luck with that, you know, there are a lot more money option. And thanks to technology that you can bypass these days, a lot of those, you know, and those uh, control control information flow and, and, and server and, and, and operator. So I think that is that is the current stage. But after two years of two years of military coups, they 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 get help from Russia, mainly Russia these days about the psychological warfare and also information flow, and also they got a firewall uh, from China um, to 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 keep their uh, soldier defending. And army, you know, ego rather of their own ego rather from China. So this is the this is the current situation. Mm. So the army is trying very hard to control and the communication flow, information flow back to their control. But I think it is very difficult this day due to uh, newly developed technology this day. Mm. And in your opinion, why did they not just shut the internet off entirely? Because they were experimenting with having the internet shut off for half the day, and then several days it was off. That was in the first couple months, and they and now it's it's they they restricted in certain areas where there's campaigns, but generally the the internet's working in some of the big areas. So why why would they leave the internet on and not just shut it off completely? I think they they if they shut it out completely, they are shooting their own food. Remember during things in government and somewhat uh, the government, they are talking about e-government and e-commerce and everything e. So mm-hmm. most of the business and administration is, I think, slowly transformed into the uh, the e-internet uh, base uh, base uh, economy. For example, banking. You know there was a lot of chaos, and they try. I'm, I'm not saying that they didn't try. They did. They did try. To shut down completely, but it didn't work because of even the banking, you know, because of they freeze all the assets and then, you know, they allow only a very limited amount to withdraw. And then it is all through uh, internet banking or, or ATMs or, or online banking. And also, also, I mean, if you look at the uh, Burmese passport recently, you know, it is, I mean, because of, because of the military rule and because of all these economic drama. And mismanagement, a lot of young people are trying to leave uh, out of the country. But then, you know, they introduced the online uh, passport system recently uh, back, back, to, back in place. They're trying to shut down, but it didn't work. Seems like if they are going to completely shut down, they are shooting their own food. Um, I think most of, most of the basic infrastructure, you know, from the uh, issuing passport, banking, communication, I mean, now they already somewhat transfer. Um, it is uh, somewhat, you know, it's all online now. And so I think it is almost impossible to completely shut out. So what they can do, only monitor and surveillance. That is the only option. And also, of course, they have to put a heavy and heavy uh, firewall. That's the only option. It is almost impossible. After like five to seven years, let's say, you know, from, from the 2012, 2013, and uh, 2020, 21. So it's uh, seven to eight years to uh, mainly internet based, you know, leak fraud, fraud um, like uh, mobile banking, 
you know, the money transfer, online transfer, and also these, you know, uh, uh, most of the uh, processing of the uh, online system, it's in place, you know. So it's almost impossible to shut down. Although I may mean, really hate to uh, see, you know, uh, they're out of control. So I think, you know, if they completely shut down, they shoot in their own food, impossible to back to the old days or pre-2010 and no internet or, or, or no telecommunication. So I think it is a little too late and to completely shut down. All they have to do, all they can do is, you know, is put a heavy surveillance on the system, in the, on, on the operator, and also, I mean, keeping a monitor uh, about this uh, cyber uh, online activities. So it is almost impossible to completely shut down at this stage. Mm. One of the things they do do is they, as we've referenced several times in the conversation, is they they have blackouts and they've had blackouts in strategic areas in the last couple of years. But this is not new. There were blackouts in Rakhine State going years back. So explain a bit about the history and the strategic thinking behind, as well as the technical process of how they actually do it. Um, the, uh, the the military use of of regional blackouts at certain times and places. Okay, there is a history of, you know, no news is bad news in Burma. In the old days, information blackout, something bad happened. Like 2007, Saffron Revolution. In those days, before the internet is uh, available, so they completely shut down everything. So there is a saying that no news is bad news for Burma. So the same thing. Now, there is, you know, very interesting, specific time blackout. Then what they do is uh, army back, a uh, operator, mm-hmm. mainly from Saiwa, that is a uh, suddenly you, you receive the very weird uh, uh, SMS message about the misinformation, mainly leading to the uh, Dozan Suji or very public figure, you know, some rumor mm-hmm. uh, widely circulated why there, there is a particular time slot blackout. So, which means that there is a very active organized cyber uh, unit operation. And so what they do, they they do particular time slot and then completely black out and then they they start producing the misinformation or rumor that they want and favor to the army, some kind of they want to that is that is how that is a, that's become a very scary operation that we are experiencing. So whenever there is internet or or, or telecommunication blackout, we start to say that that's you know there there will be one bad really bad thing going to happen. So this is this is how they operate. So until now, we keep keep an eye on that kind of specific, you know, um, timely blackout. Mm. That you know, when when there is a vacuum, then there will be some misinformation and disinformation, and um, will will be come out by the army side war department. This is this is the, the the tactic that they are using. Another one is regular blackout on the on the uh, uh, military operation. So whenever there is a heavy military operation, mainly in Sakai, Namagwen, and Chin area, there is also complete blackout before before the army heavy operation. So these are the things that you know the, the way the army operates. Right, and with, without without putting anyone at risk or giving away any confidential information, can you share anything you know about what it feels like to be in an area that's blacked out and how people communicate? If the normal lines of communication are dropped, what what alternative or traditional or 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 unusual methods of communication and inform, information flow exist in those regions where the blackout occurs? I think there there is somehow you know. Since the 2008 nugget, there is a limited private um, satellite facility available because uh, we know that we've been using effectively to report uh, cyclone nuggets, which is 2008, May 2nd, which is not, not long ago. And then, you know, there, there is a limited use of private, but it's quite expensive to operate. And there is a, I'm not saying that, you know, that's why there is no way that they can completely uh, block up. And there is also limited... FM um, station, uh, mainly in the in the Simi Library area. I'm talking about Chin, Shan, and Karani, and Magui is a guy. There is a limited um, a local FM station in operation. On top of that, there is a national coverage like Mizima. Mizima is doing the national uh, satellite elevation, and also 
also radio coverage. And recent BBC Media Asian survey indicate that Missy Mar is the the the, the most uh, most uh, listen or receive uh, independence information in Myanmar, which is 69% of audience. We are talking about 28 million. That is the latest BBC media audience survey available. We were shocked to see that number, followed by DVB and Kete. Mm. So Kete is only the online operator. So these days, um, although you know there is a, a heavy attempt to block the information flow, especially in the conflict area or, or semi-liberated area, there is somehow a lot of information flow that's almost unstopped there, I have to put it that way, via, you know, satellite TV and shortwave radio and also, also the uh, local FM station and limited, uh, limited uh, independent uh, satellite uh, facilities available. So these are happening. So I think on top of that, there is, of course, water mouth change of, you know, there is a... a and privately uh, transport system, change of information flow like old days, going back and cross-border communication. I remember Saffron Revolution, most of the information uh, came out from inside Burma and Smerga to Thailand. Mm-hmm. I used to go and receive most of the face-to-face you know, information uh, from the Thai Burma border, and then we package in Norway and air back to Burma through satellite. TV and radio, that, that kind of change uh, happening actively cross-border activity also happening if you have a bigger fine or, or, or you know, mass care or atrocity, bigger information flow. And so so there are many different ways of communication. And we try very hard to get this information uh, uh, information flow, I mean, continue uh, come uh, in and out of, out of, my, out of country, uh, Bama, Myanmar. Mm. Now, I know in Ukraine, when that crisis developed, they immediately had access to Elon Musk's uh, Starlink, which provided satellite internet. And there have been attempts in Myanmar to try to get Starlink accessed in some of the regions there. What do you know about the role that Starlink has played in helping the movement in Ukraine? And to what extent it's been proposed or possible in coming to Myanmar and what would providing better satellite internet in Myanmar at this time do? How would, how would that play a helping role at this time? I think, you know, we are uh, really looking into this uh, Starlink and potential. If you go and click Starlink, Burma, Myanmar, or even in Thailand border, they said the service is not available, but service were available in 2023, which is this year. So we hoping that, you know, there will be a Starlink service available in Myanmar, Burma. And we know that Ukraine, you know, Stalin had a very, a very important role in terms of communication after Russia blackout. There is a already prepaid and Stalin, and, and I mean, Stalin is quite cheap compared with those, you know, limited uh, satellite facility we have. I mean, I'm talking about very expensive uh, in terms of operation and white. I'm not talking about you know, uh, 2,500 US dollar to operate one, uh, one uh, independent, you know, uh, 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 fees, you know. Uh, uh. So we are hoping that the Stalin will help Burma, Myanmar um, uh, in terms of communication flow. Because they are affordable, they have footprint, all they need is they can expand their little network uh, available into Burma, Myanmar. With those, you know, they are own smaller little, uh, little I think, KU band and two feet uh, prepaid dish, which is, which is, you know, installation fee is very cheap. And so monthly operation is uh, very cheap compared with uh, other, like less than uh, 400 or 500 US dollar a month. And then you got uh, unlimited internet access. That is what we are hoping. And, uh, and we write a lot to Loma too, to open, switch on. They, they have what they promised that they will were, they were come into Bama, Myanmar in 2023. So this is the right time, and it's it's have a lot of, I mean, basically it's have it save a lot of people life, because of, like I said, you know, there is a ZD Bowman, and next village they didn't know because of army blackout information. So we they will help a lot of, they will save a lot of people about the early warning system and about the mm-hmm. armies, you know, uh, aeroplane Bowman. Also, how to get access to uh, humanitarian aid through the information. So we hope in that Stalin. We're coming to Bama Myanmar as they promised in 2023. And also in co- co- collaborate with Bama Ad and DA Ad, which is the American Ad, you know, 
and to boost their strategic communication in Bama Nyama. And we are really needing it, especially those, you know, semi liberated area, like namely, you know, half of the country, you know, we call it K3C, Karen, Kachin, Kareni, and Chin. They are almost 75% liberated and under their control. On top of that, there is a Zagai, Magwe, now, now the huge part of Tanesari, they are, they began liberated. So we want those uh, info, those uh, satellite facility from uh, Starlink and uh, to come and operate in those you know uh, semi liberated area and also uh, able to access you know their 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 satellite uh, satellite footprint and satellite coverage. I think that will help millions of people live through you know the early warning system about the air raid you know air bombing. So the uh, and also the the information flow that the Obama's army tried very hard to block, getting the help of uh, Russia and, and China, and also Stalin can help a lot of people living in the big city like Nepiro, Yangon, Mandalay about those heavily surveillance and you know monitor uh, service that run by Mainte, Burmese and Vietnamese army in, in, and run telecommunication and service. You know, then you know we should have a uh, other alternative service that you know that uh, without uh, uh, respect the privacy and then boost the information flow and rights to information and rights to digital digital rights. So I think this is a good timing, uh, also very critical time to to the uh, operator like Starlink and also other other satellite company to come into Burma, Myanmar, start operating with those semi or fully liberated area. I'm talking about more than half of the countries. And also uh, uh, give access to those, you know, who live under the military control uh, to get the alternative uh, communication means. That will help, I think, of course, you know, uh, that will help uh, democracy and federal state in Burma. And I think that will be the beginning of the end of the army attempt to block the, block the information flow. So we really request those, you know, and not only uh, uh, Stalin and uh, Eloma, but also other uh, other uh, other uh, satellite operator or telecommunication operator to come into Burma, start operating, and help those, you know, millions of Burma in need of the independence, you know, um, uh, access to uh, access to information. And, and also the uh, the 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 digital, uh, digital footprint that will have a lot of Burmese democratic movement, and hopefully they will be they will be hand in hand with uh, uh, come through this you know American NDA or Obama Act. I think you know that will be the game changer. And uh, if we got that kind of assistance, I think you know of course, and uh, within one year, Burma Myanmar will change and uh, will be the democratic country. So we really request. And those, you know, international operator, mainly Stalin, to start operating in Burma, Myanmar, and other 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 services like in India, you know, there is a ceiling of many other, you name it. And also, we really need and those, you know, uh, those independent uh, to in order to operate our our uh, uh, radio or, or, or our FM station. We still need internet, independent internet asset in those liberated or semi liberated area. So I think I'm really requesting those operators to think twice and, and, and come into uh, active uh, operation into Burma, Myanmar. I mean, that, that does sound just enormously important in terms of saving lives, in terms of helping the democracy movement and resisting a, a state-controlled military tyranny, oppression of the people. Uh, do, do you have any sense of... B- why it's not being provided, both in terms of uh, Starlink and some of the other independent satellites, as well as the NDAA, the Burma Act. Do you have any sense of of why it's not being provided yet when it's so incredibly urgent or any sense of timeline as to when it will be or, or conditions involved? What, 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 what are the reasons why it's not available yet and what, what do they have to work out in order to provide this access? Oh, one of the journalists named Burma Myanmar problem, you know, compared with Ukraine, you know, Burma Myanmar, uh, about the Indonesian uh, uh, concern is outreach and do nothing. No, uh, outreach, but no action uh, policy. Um, it is uh, always, you know, if you look at the U- UN Security Council, there is an outreach and there is a heavy, uh, really concern, but there is no action, you know. Um, when it's compared to Ukraine, I mean, we are we feel like we are second 
second citizenship. So I think, I mean, this is the time. Maybe, of course, one year is past, two years is military control. I think it is, we have to switch, you know, this outrage and, and uh, outrage, but no action and policy to, you know, very proactive, real meaningful help, especially helping in terms of strategic communication. I think that is a, that is a vital need. If you really seriously serious about Burma, Myanmar, start thinking about boosting this information flow and boosting the you know strategic communication. Open it up. That is already policy. U.S. has a heavy bureaucracy. Of course, start talking about U.S. Also, if they are serious about Burma, Myanmar policy in terms of geopolitics, they start uh, thinking about these serious options. They start talking. They should start talking with the Starlink and make that happen. Make that into action, not only outreach, you know, the reactive action will be the, mm-hmm. will be the game changer. I hope, you know, that, that yeah. they will start considering this as a, one of the most important urgent need, you know, because of the spread out non that. What do you mean non that? I think start from this information flow, strategic communication, it's a real meaningful non that support. And that can help a lot of, you know, early warnings, can save a lot of humanitarian uh, assistance, and, you know, many other will follow up. And so I think they have to be really, really consider active engagement to open up this information flow and also the digital gateway. I think that would, that would be the game changer of the Bama Myanmar, Myanmar issues at the moment. Mm, right. Let's certainly hope that's the case. Um, I, I also want to ask you about kind of your ideal vision of looking at flow of information and communication in Myanmar, projecting it sometime in the future, assuming a, a post Tatmadaw federal democracy. The reason I ask this is because we talk about Myanmar going from this extreme of heavily controlled, censored, limited uh, state information to suddenly the floodgates opening and being able to have a free flow of of communication and news that's accessible and, and cheap as well. But along with that, you have extraordinary uh, an extraordinary amount of media literacy. You also have military spying and military propaganda and psyops. And so what and, and this is because things went from one extreme to another and and just the, the the floodgates opened and everything came out, everything good and bad all at once. So if you were to project, you know, years into the future and imagine that in, in some way some federal democracy has come in, in some some probably imperfect form, but it, it's come in some way, what um how would you like to see or mold or shape the uh the balance of people being able to enjoy an affordable and safe and private form of communication with um, with also unlimited access to news coming from different sources about different topics and to balance that that freedom of what they're able to access and how they're able to communicate with the state controls of a lack of spying and lack of propaganda that's that I know that's I understand that's asking for a lot but in in your mind what what kind of balance would you like to see in the shape that communication and access to news can take in a post tatmadaw future i think you know i have no doubt that Burmese army were trying their best to control information flow and they would boost their um, they were boosted this, you know, psychological warfare toward their soldiers and the, and people with the help of uh, Russia and China. If you look at, you know, Chinese foreign ministry minister is in Yang Obama uh, yesterday. He's going to India today, and then there is a, a, a heavy presence of Russia. What Russia are good at, of course, there is a psychological warfare, and there is a, a cyber cyber. Uh, operation, you know, they were they were they were trying their best to boost, you know, to raise to for two reasons. Bama Myanmar Army is facing biggest defect defection. There are there are so far, you know, more than twenty thousand soldiers. So they they never be that the high number of defector army army defector uh, defection to there. So they were blocked that one. How do they block? Definitely they were do their own, you know, elbow rather than all keeping soldier in the uh, Saddam and the Jida space. So they were do, And also they are admitting there is a leak, uh, interior minister uh, uh, document saying that they are losing the media battle. So they need to control. They, they even uh, uh, name the amounts, I mean, the billions of jets uh, for the net- network of informats. And they, they're losing the information battle. So they are going to boost 
and they're going to win. You know, if you look at the army budget recently, they double. I'm talking about billions of dollars injection into the defense budget for this year. So that 2023, you can regard, I can easily project army will do their best to boost their uh, information flow, site war, and, and the digital warfare, and by the help of Russia and, Russia and China. How are you going to counter? They will do, uh, they will introduce, they will, they will boost more of their firewall, especially make sure that there is no army defection. How, why, why soldier decided to defy? I, I've been interviewing a lot of defender soldiers. Basically, because of information, they got that what is going on because of army. I mean, make sure that they are watching the Nyawadi army TV channel and also they are their own uh, uh, Telegram channel and army back channel. Um, but those soldiers got information out of that and then decided to defend. So this year, I mean, we're trying their best. Then, how are you going to counter this? Only way it is, you know, we have to counter. Uh, with the information uh, operator, we have to invite. We, there should be more, more accessible. I mean, it is a people, not profit. Like, I, I completely understand. Starling is profit oriented organization, but in come in, when it's come to Obama, it is the people first. Like what they did to Ukraine, I think you know it's it's not much. I mean, but so it is a it is a people before the profit. So I I know that you know a lot of telecommunication or or other company, they are their primary concern is about how to maximize profit. But it is Obama, Myanmar. So it is the people that matter. So they have to consider, you know, about at least one year. Let's see. I mean, I'm I'm not talking about endless, you know, timeline. Let's do it. Let's see one year of those, you know, uh, strategy uh, access to information. Let's open it up. Then, you know, Burmese, we Burmese, especially younger generation, we will do the job. We will bring the army into the highest defection right. There is a no biggest, uh, uh, like a regiment or battalion uh, defect, defect that happened yet. Only individual level or uh, small, smaller group level. We can turn that, we can turn that uh, into the bigger, bigger, you know, uh, disintegration of the armed force. Morally, they are really in bad shape. I've been interviewed a lot of, a lot of defector soldiers. So let's, let's, let's invest one year. I mean, projection from, from now for at least you know this this year, let's boost uh, the information flow. Let's let's consider you know pay by first before the profit. I think that would be that would means a lot a lot for these democratic forces. And also be serious if you are talking about change in Burma, serious about it. And we can start from this you know and this information gateway. And especially young people, they know how to do it. I give you one specific uh, example. And the army, they care. He, they they care that. Uh, the MPs, Rapa, Seattle, and what Burmese you do? They put him in the games. You know, uh, a week ago, Burmese army has to announce not to play the game, online games. That, you know, Seattle physically died. But on the game, he did stay alive. That's how resistant is. You have to understand this younger generation, the, the, the digital resistant and formal resistant change. So from the shifting of this traditional, you know, I'm resistant to, there will be more cyber dissidents. There will be more digital dissidents. Online games is, now I mean, is really having a new battle of this, you know, online game that, that physically they kill the Seattle, the rapper, young MP, but now he's stay alive among the Burmese young people. So let's continue this kind of, uh, this kind of, you know, cyber dissidents uh, uh, among the younger people. So I think I think it is very important uh, to boost this communication uh, projection. At least let's try for one year, um, and that is my 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 sincere request. You know that will be also mean a lot a lot for Burmese democracy and uh, democratic movement. Mm, absolutely, I mean you've made such a case. You've made the case in terms of how important the um, <clears throat> getting access to internet is to combat the mil- the military disinformation and propaganda, the uh, humanitarian crisis that's going on for um, early warning and, and prevention. And, and then you just open the door on military defection and how that one of the re- – and I've, I've heard this from other guests. I've, I've been hearing this for some time that one of the reasons why they restrict – access to the internet is more for their own people getting access to the truth and and getting beyond their propaganda of why they're justifying the killing that's going on to outside information. And so 
access to internet can actually, and access to communication and news can actually help in defection, which is, like, let's face it, you know, this is this is the uh, having soldiers put down their weapons. This is this is the most nonviolent outcome that one can hope for. That you you don't have to you don't have to fight a soldier. The soldier just puts down their weapon and, and stops killing innocent people. So if turning the internet on and turning lines of communication and information flows can do that, that's that's a really compelling argument, and uh, it, it's really sad and and really really painful to hear that this is not being done because there's just simply not enough outrage. And so we de- we definitely encourage those people that are listening to uh, have a little bit of outrage. If you're living in the United States or, or in other places that have the potential of supporting uh, Burma to be able to voice a bit of outrage to wherever you can, to uh, local politicians or um, or media or online or anywhere else about just how critical it is uh, and how achievable it is to get access of communication and new and, and information flows in these places. So that's that's all a very compelling argument that you've laid out. Thank you very much. Yeah, that is the message, you know, help, help us yeah. in this, you know, uh, uh, information uh, flow and the uh, access to information and rights to the uh, digital rights that can change. That will, that will be the most vital important for, for protection mm-hmm. or at least for the next year, this year, the next year. Mm-hmm. And and also uh, bear in mind that you know this uh, spring revolution or Generation Z, they are actually the digital native. They are the young people who know mm-hmm. very well how to use effective use of you know information. So I think mm-hmm. that I think that is also the hope for the, our our future. My generation, mm-hmm. 1988 generation, we were come from very close country. We got no idea, relying on mm-hmm. the software radio, Bami service, BBC, into you know mm-hmm. uh, current. Very digital, innovative, and the Zeta and cyber the Zeta age. I think, I think that's the beginning of the end of the Burmese military. Mm, absolutely, those are those are good points, and let's let's hope it continues in that way. And with that, thank you so much for taking the time to explain that in detail to our audience. It was very powerful stuff. Thank you very much, Josh. Good on you, mate. As inspiring as today's guest was, I know from experience that when you're listening from so far away, there can also be a certain kind of helplessness in hearing about the people's dire struggles. Thankfully, our nonprofit offers a reliable way for interested listeners to provide financial assistance to those local communities who need it most. Your donations will be sent to support urgent humanitarian missions, as well as those vulnerable peoples being impacted by the military coup. By taking an active role in supporting the movement, you can help ensure that people like today's speaker have even a few more resources to draw on and can manage just another week in continuing their efforts. If you would like to join in our mission to support those in Myanmar who are being impacted by the military coup, we welcome your contribution in any form, currency, or transfer method. Your donation will go on to support a wide range of humanitarian and media missions, aiding those local communities who need it most. Donations are directed to such causes as the Civil Disobedience Movement, CDM, Families of Deceased Victims, Internally Displaced Person IDP Camps, Food for Impoverished Communities, Military Defection Campaigns, Undercover Journalists, Refugee Camps, Monasteries and Nunneries, Education Initiatives, the purchasing of protective equipment and medical supplies, COVID relief, and more. We also make sure that our donation fund supports a diverse range of religious and ethnic groups across the country. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about past projects as well as upcoming needs. You can give a general donation or earmark your contribution to a specific activity or project you would like to support, perhaps even something you heard about in this very episode. All of this humanitarian work is carried out by our nonprofit mission, Better Burma. Any donation you give on our Insight Myanmar website is directed towards this fund. Alternatively, you can also visit the Better Burma website, betterburma.org, and donate directly there. In either case, your donation goes to the same cause in both websites except credit card. You can also give via PayPal by going to paypal.me slash betterburma. Additionally, we can take donations through Patreon, Venmo, GoFundMe, and Cash App. Simply search Better Burma on each platform and you'll find our account. You can also visit either website for specific links to these respective accounts or email us at info at 
That's Better Burma, one word, spelled B-E-T-T-E-R-B-U-R-M-A dot org. If you would like to give it another way, please contact us. We also invite you to check out our range of handicrafts that are sourced from vulnerable artisan communities across Myanmar, available at alokacrafts.com. Any purchase will not only support these artisan communities, but also our nonprofit's wider mission. That's Aloka Crafts, spelled A L O K A C R A F T S, one word, alokacrafts.com. Thank you so much for your kind consideration and support.